so very good evening to all my students so it's so good to be back amongst my dear students and see that's you in the picture and you would have guessed by now why we are meeting we are meeting today exactly to understand how to utilize newspaper and broadly speaking current affairs in our upsc preparation and journey you see the first question that arises the moment we open newspaper or any current affairs content is which source to follow see there are so many newspapers that you have at hand so look at this look at the plethora of newspapers and what it leads to is confusion that what to select what not to select right so i am here to tell you two things precisely one how to prepare for current affairs if you are trying to prepare for current affairs for this upsc upsc 2024 or upsc 25 26 or 27 what should be your approach in your journey towards upsc preparation related to current affairs and the second thing we at wajiram are uh, starting a new program called as smart current affairs program i'm going to tell you how this program can help you in precisely planning your uh, current affairs journey so that you can utilize this program to get the optimum results in your prelims mains and interview now see guys let me first tell you before we start that what exactly is current affairs you see people will tell you that current affairs is uh, actually a one way traffic and people will tell you that current affairs is a very long journey very difficult to achieve right so you keep on running 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 you keep on studying so many subjects you keep on studying so many content you will be confused how to do it well this concept of current affairs that it is infinite and it's a very long journey which has no end is absolutely wrong what should we do exactly for current affairs the first thing that you should keep in mind about current affairs is this that current affairs should be covered only to that extent that later on you can revise and revisit if you do not understand till what extent the coverage should be so that later on you can come and revise it then the whole idea of preparing current affairs becomes almost futile so the first thing that we should understand about current affairs is we have to limit our sources we have to strategize and plan current affairs in such a way that we go only that far that we are able to come back revise and utilize current affairs for prelims mains and interview that's the very first point for this purpose what we are doing is there are two programs Uh, so first is smart prelims current affairs program and then there is integrated one so what is the difference between these two uh, and i will be involved in uh, both these programs so i thought why not introduce this program to you guys so you see for the prelims current affairs program we are going to start it on 17th of february it will run uh, till around your prelims now it will be almost a 3 months program so we'll be holding the classes for 3 days a week uh, the class timings would be roughly around 2:30 it will be around 2 hours class now you can attend this lecture both online and offline mode now <clears throat> this one is integrated program so if you join us for the integrated program this will be your phase 1 your phase 2 will start for mains related preparation in june and it will last till september 2024 again this will also be a 3 uh, days a week program so if you are joining us only for prelims then the duration will be feb to may but if you are joining us for integrated preparation this will be your phase 1 and this one june to september will be phase 2 so that's about the program now what exactly is going to be the coverage here so let me tell you what we have designed for this uh, program for you guys so let us look at this one this side this is the prelim side only prelims and this one is for mains so this is what we have planned for you so see if you look at the prelims part which we have planned for you so let me tell you first what will be our focus for your preparation so the focus will be for prelims purposes the focus will be maps very crucial i'll show you some questions also today and how to actually handle those questions so the focus will be maps crucial facts events reports indices etc you know the beauty of uh, prelims is coverage so there is only up to a limit that you have to go in the depth you don't have to do a research or phd for prelims purposes so what you need to do for prelims purposes is precisely know what to pick from different sources and then use it replicate it 
So that's called focus areas. Now let's look at the scope. So what are we going to do in the prelims related program? So see guys, whenever you study a concept, for example, I'll, I'll make reference to today's interim budget. In the interim budget, what did you notice today? In the interim budget, the government of India has said today that the focus of interim budget is Gyan. And this came today, right? The finance minister announced that the focus of the interim budget is Gyan. What is Gyan? You can see four pictures there. So what does this uh, theme of the budget represent? This is the interim budget, right? So G means poor. So the, the word that the government of India has used is G for Garib, uh, which means poor. Y for youth. A for Annadata. Annadata means farmer. You can see that you have farmer here, right? And this picture represents a person who is from low income group. Now, <clears throat> this is farmer, right? And then you have N for women. So you see women, Y for youth. Youth means you guys. This is the theme of the budget, guys. Now, for prelims purposes, what to pick from this theme? For prelims purposes, there is one thing that you need to pick. So, for example, UPSC can ask you a question. Yeah, exactly. UPSC can ask you a question that what are the four themes or components or what are what is the theme of the budget, interim budget this year? Uh, second question that could go slightly deeper would be, uh, they might ask you a question related to who measures poverty in India. What is the formula that we you know, use to measure poverty level? What are the poverty figures given by United Nations Multidimensional Poverty Index? Or what is the you know, uh, figure for poverty uh, as told by Niti Aayog? These are some of the factual questions and conceptual question could be that how do we measure poverty? So poverty in India is measured by a poverty line. So next question could be, how do you define a poverty line? Poverty line is defined based on income or expenditure. These are some of the questions that can be traced back. So this is how you they can ask you questions. So for example, from women, they can ask you a question that what are self-help groups? Because in this budget, the government of India is also talking about promoting self-help group. And a scheme has been talked about by the government, which is... Uh, related to Mudra Yojana, where the government is trying to give more financial allocation to the women. These are the things that we need to study when we study the interim budget this year for prelims. But if the same thing will be asked in mains, the dimension of the question will change. What will they ask uh, in mains? They will ask you that what are the steps taken by government of India for women empowerment? This, this would be GS paper two. So from the budget, you have to trace this back to women empowerment where Gender budgeting would be just a small component. And you have to talk about other dimensions of women empowerment as well. Yeah. So this is what you have to pick from here. So for example, youth. In youth, you can talk about so many things. For example, skill, health, education, research and development. Did you notice in the interim budget, the government of India has said that they are creating a corpus from which funds can be taken at low rate of interest to promote research and development. Again, so because in India is full of creative youth, and if you don't give facility to the youth and keep telling them that, hey, you have not achieved any research or breakthrough technology, that's not right. Unless we empower youth through uh, financial empowerment, through various supports, handholding support, it is not possible that youth will be able to harness their full potential. So I think this is one step in the right direction. So this is how you have to pick things uh, from the current affairs and use it for prelims purposes. Now, let me take you back to what we are planning to do here. See, so the scope is here in prelims, we will establish the linkage between whatever are the facts stated in the newspaper and the underlying concept. So this would be one. Coverage. What are we going to cover in the prelims program? We are going to cover various newspapers like Hindu, Indian Express, Economic Times, PIB, Yojana Kurukshetra. But here Yojana Kurukshetra coverage would only be related to the prelims part. And then we will also do some magazines uh, for example, some magazines which normally uh, we don't get time to do as students, which is like down to earth. And since you know that only interim budget has been released before prelims, so we'll be doing this here in terms of coverage. Handouts. This is very special. So, you know, there is one thing which I have observed as a faculty here by interacting with you all and you all know it that when you study current affairs and you make exhaustive notes, you are not able to come back and revise at all. So you put in your best efforts, your blood and sweat into it. But if you cannot revise it, that becomes sort of a negative factor in our preparation. So in this program, what we are doing is there, are, there is a dedicated team uh, where we are working on a very concise handout, very precise handout, so that this handout will act 
like your revision notes just before prelims. You do not need to add anything. You do not need to alter it at all. Uh, because if you join this program and then you are with us and then still you will have to modify your handouts, I think uh, that would be very unfair. So the handout will take care of all your requirements till your prelims. Now let's talk about mains. What are we going to do in the mains program? See, in mains program, the things are slightly uh, slightly complex. Why? Because in mains, if you study a news, if you read a news from a newspaper or a magazine, you immediately have to link it with all the contemporary developments which have happened in that field. So, for example, suppose that you read in the news that GDP of India is increasing. Why? So, all the news related to GDP which has been released in last one year or let's say uh, 13 to 14 months, you have to trace it back and connect all the dots. That, okay, what led to increase in GDP? What are the efforts by government of India? For example, in the recent uh, budget, which is today's budget, interim budget, government of India has said that they are going to increase the capital expenditure by this percentage. Right. So this is what the government of India has said. Now, just knowing this is not good enough for mains. How do you trace it back for mains? So for mains, you have to go back and find out that in the budget, there are two types of expenditures. First is revenue expenditure and second is capital expenditure. Revenue expenditure is day to day expenditure of the government of India. So anything which we are wasting in terms of expenditure that should be curtailed. So this should be curtailed. This should be increased. What happens if you increase this? Three things happen if you increase this. First, uh, crowding in effect happens. Multiplier effect happens and positive externality happens. If you do all these three things, what will happen? GDP of India will increase. Right. So this is how you trace it back, which means that for mains, you have to find out what are the steps taken by government of India to promote capital expenditure and which industries are actually getting the benefit of this capital expenditure. This is what we have to see. So that is why this one becomes very important that for mains preparation, you pick up a news and trace it back and see what are the dimensions that you have to cover. Now, you see, what is the scope here? This is interesting. Why? Because whenever you pick up a news item for mains purposes, you have to see that why it was launched. What is that bigger target that the government of India is trying to achieve through that? So through capital expenditure, the biggest target, why government is promoting capital expenditure? Because through this, the biggest target of the government of India is twofold. One, increase GDP. Second, increase employment. Because on these two counts, India's track record has not been great. So government, and especially since demonetization phase. So government is trying to recover and then COVID happened. So we are trying to create these two things through capital expenditure. So which means that the scope, scope would be pick up a news and try to see its uh, backward linkage and forward linkage that going forward, what would it lead to and why it started. So these are the things we will do. Now, in terms of coverage, we are going to cover as... Uh, I already told you, newspapers, magazine. There is one magazine which we have added in mains, which is Economic and uh, Political Weekly. And then Judgments of the Court, this has to be added. Then Budget 2024 Economic Survey, whenever it is released. Now about the handouts for mains preparation. The handouts for mains preparation would be slightly different. Why? Because for mains, whenever you select a topic, you have to cover all the dimensions. For example, if you select a topic called as poverty alleviation, you have to cover the social aspect, economic aspect, political aspect, no international aspects. And then you have to quote if there is any judgment by the court, right? So facts, figures and analysis, everything has to be done, which means the ultimate aim of the handout of mains is that it should empower you for answer writing. That is why when we design the handout for mains, it will directly help you in answer writing. So this is what we are planning for you in terms of uh, these two programs that we are launching. Now, coming back to current affairs, that how to handle it, actually, various uh, facets of current affairs. So first, I want to tell you where exactly the current affairs fits in your UPSC preparation. I'm going to divide the significance of current, of current affairs, its significance into uh, three different heads. The first is prelims. Second is mains and third is your interview. Mind you, uh, my dear students, that um, current affairs should not be looked as an instrument for prelims. 
because your ultimate aim is not prelims your ultimate aim is not mains your ultimate aim is to qualify the upsc exam and current affairs fits all these stages let's see how so when i was doing the analysis i found something very interesting of, of almost last 15 to 17 years analysis i have found that roughly around 30 to 35 direct questions are asked in upsc prelims from current affairs if you include indirect questions also like something was in the news related to that they ask a question if you if you take the indirect questions also into account on many occasions for example the year 2015 if you check the upsc paper you can see that more than 50 questions were asked from current affairs itself so if you include indirect question it goes to 50 and 60 also but direct precise questions from current affairs uh, it says that roughly around 30 to 35 questions i have seen now what about mains preparation today i'll show you uh, various questions that have been asked in mains from current affairs and how to handle them see so in gs paper 2 this is a very dynamic paper because here you have papers like um, international relations social sector schemes uh, you have polity you have governance so many dimensions are covered here so direct current affairs application is there in gs paper 2 gs paper 3 is absolutely dynamic like 2 so here also you will see a lot of current affairs optional you can use current affairs in fact you should use current affairs to make your answers richer to give more power to your answers similarly essay you can use a lot of current affairs anecdotes examples there to base your essay there are two inter interesting things which i have found and i will uh, show it through an example in gs paper one especially in that geography paper which is there so i have seen in a few years very interesting finding that one or two concepts from economic survey were asked in geography question for example in gs paper one i remember that uh, around 2016 a question was asked in uh, upsc where they asked question related to urban planning which was given in economic survey but it was asked in gs paper one so <clears throat> this this can become an important part and then gs paper four uh, i could identify a few questions which are directly inspired from current affairs so reference is made to current affairs in gs paper one and four as well now, in interview, uh, as you know that interview is not just a test of knowledge, but yes, the way to test your personality is also through questions which are more contemporary in nature. So in UPSC interview, they ask you many, many understanding based, opinion based, current affairs related questions. And, in, and on occasions, they also ask you questions related to some facts. So for example, I have seen that in UPSC interview, as a candidate enters the the interview hall the first question they will ask you after greeting you is that what is the magnitude of india's budget this year and they will surprise you with all these things they will ask you that okay tell us what is the unemployment level of india how many people are below poverty line what is the average per capita income of india these are some of the questions to which they welcome you just to unsettle you a bit and then see your reaction so yes if you are prepared for these things it adds on to your preparation now let us focus on the prelims part that what exactly is the role of current affairs in prelims? I've got ample examples to show you. And through these examples, you'll be able to pick uh, those areas where you need to focus for current affairs. Let, let's focus on the prelims part first. See, guys. So what I've done is I've uh, done a small analysis, which will tell you, give you an idea about where from the current affairs questions are being asked. So see, these are the subjects. These are the years. You can see this is 23, 22, 21. 25 2015 and these are the average questions that were asked in each subject now what i have done is suppose that average 20 questions are asked from economics 14 from polity 12 from geography etc these are the average questions so out of these average questions i was just trying to find out how many questions were directly or very closely linked to current affairs so out of these 20 questions which they ask on an average in economics I could clearly see that roughly 10 to 12 questions, uh, they are uh, current affairs based, which means almost 50% questions that they ask in economics is directly or indirectly related to current affairs. So if there are four options, two would be current affairs, two would be static. You cannot answer that without current affairs. So first option will be fiscal deficit means borrowing. Second option will be uh, fiscal deficit targets are controlled through FRBM Act. Third would be the last five year average fiscal deficit of India is 5.1%. You cannot answer this question if you don't know the current affairs. So that is why 10 to 12 questions are from current affairs. Now, 
in environment you can clearly see that if they ask you on an average let's say 13 question 13 to 15 question 9 to 10 question are directly from current affairs huge huge uh, contribution there in science and tech uh, as i can see average number of question you can clearly see science has been giving consistently very good number of questions by the way so suppose that 12 13 questions are asked in science roughly 8 to 9 are asked from current affairs again you can see subject wise breakup i know that one question that would come to your mind uh, during this kind of uh, current affairs related uh, sessions or seminars is that which subjects to emphasize for current affairs and that's precisely your answer that in economics almost 50 percent and here more than 50 percent in environment and uh, science tech almost 90 percent questions are current affairs based and then you can see that in ir and miscellaneous miscellaneous current affairs would mean current affairs related to let's say sports right so that i put under miscellaneous and ir related map work related etc i put here as six so if you include these two miscellaneous as well as ir roughly around nine or ten here so if you add everything you will see that roughly around 30 to 35 direct questions if you add indirect questions also where one of the options is current affairs this number goes to sometimes 50 and 60 but i will keep a conservative image because for upsc everything in balance is required so if you take a conservative uh, uh, figure also data also then 30 to 35 direct question and if you take even those questions where one of the options is current affairs it goes well above 50 sometimes 60 as well so 2015 for example direct more than 50 questions are asked from current affairs so this is your breakup so guys if you want to ask me that question that which which areas to focus on current affairs for upsc these are your areas economy environment science technology ir and miscellaneous would mean for example areas like sports now this is a small pie chart which i created this could give you some answers so let's say that this is 100 question in uh, prelims out of 100 questions i can tell you with full confidence that roughly around one third questions uh, belong to current affairs uh, that that's the analysis that i have found roughly around one third it could be 30 it could be 35 it could be 33 roughly one third is current affairs direct current affairs huh? now <clears throat> what are the remaining two third the remaining two third are direct questions from static areas like they will ask you simple thing temple architecture for example or a question from modern india simple things now then there is a second type of question which is asked in prelims which is applied questions so this is other than current affairs okay these are static areas and this is current affairs so applied questions are asked and third is interlinked so for example if they are asking you one option from inflation another option will be from taxation so in same question four options will be asked one will be from inflation one balance of payment and one is taxation they will uh, interlink all the three concepts and then they will ask you a question so these questions are slightly dangerous because this requires a lot of revision during your preparation phase this question becomes more dangerous when first three options so first option is inflation second is balance of payment third is related to tax and fourth will be from current affairs this question becomes very dangerous which means everything is required static knowledge current affairs knowledge all these things are required in a balanced manner one thing that might be troubling you is and which a lot of you asked me during my gs classes and after it as well that how many months of current affairs should you prepare they go in my opinion if you are appearing for 2024 so you can prepare from may 23 to april 24 that should be good enough but if you want ideal scenario i would say 15 to 16 months of current affairs is good enough so even if you start from january 23 and cover up to april 2024 that should be good enough right but yes uh, why do i mention this part multiple times i have mentioned it because you never know when the paper will become very heavily tilted towards current affairs so through this pie chart i was trying to show that if current affairs form 40 percent of your questions this is 60 percent never ignore the static areas you should never ignore the static areas and never be biased in upsc preparation but it might also happen that this ratio might flip this might become 60 this might become 40 like in 2015 hence it's better to create a balance now <clears throat> Let me give you some examples of, of 2022 UPSC prelims paper and 2023 UPSC prelims paper. This will give you a good idea about what questions are being asked in UPSC. See, guys. So there is one question which says, which of the following statements best reflect the idea behind the fractional orbital bombardment system? This is from technology. So why was this question asked in UPSC prelims recently? 
2022. This was asked because actually China tested this. So you see the type of options which have been created. See, let's let's go a little deeper into a hypersonic missile is launched into space to counter the asteroid approaching the Earth and explode it into space. So if you read all these options, you will find that it's not going very deep. Yeah, but it requires basic understanding of this concept. So this is prelims, guys. So if you if you get confused at how far should you go in prelims preparation, so my personal opinion is that in prelims, and I can show you more than 50 questions today, that whenever they create questions in prelims, there is a particular depth up to which they go, which is basic conceptual understanding. Because even they know that they have to select the best uh, you know, brains of this country, which is you guys. So if they ask you something really very deep, every question if they ask in a very deep manner, they won't be able to select the right candidates. Right. So that is why the paper is made in such a way that a balance is there, that you have to go up to a certain depth. They don't have to create undoable paper. So if you are reading current affairs, you would have read it somewhere in the newspaper because China had tested this. Now you can see the next question there in UPSC prelims. I just took a screenshot of the prelims paper. It says the term Levant often heard in the news roughly corresponds to which of the following. Now see, so what happened is uh, sometime back, a few months back, so Israel had used some artillery and uh, some attack on Hezbollah group. So in that context, this place was in the news. That is why it was asked in UPSC. So if you trace it back in the newspaper, you can clearly see that since Israel was in the news, Hezbollah was in the news, hence this was in the news. So which means that again, look at the type of options being created. Uh, this type of options are called as uh, you know, sort of application of map work, geography, IR, it's integrated type of option. Now, look at the next question. With reference to Indian economy, what are the advantage of inflation index bonds? Why was this in the news? This was in the news almost uh, two and a half, three years back, uh, precisely for the reason that after COVID inflation was very high in India. When inflation is very high, the government and the RBI, they try to give relief to the society and the people. So Reserve Bank of India at that time had told everybody, all the institutions in India, whosoever was releasing bonds, that can you release if possible? Can you release a bond called as inflation index bonds so as to give relief to the people who invest in the capital market? So there was a circular and a notice by RBI. And that is precisely the reason that this question was asked at that time. So do you see this, that questions that are asked in the name of current affairs are never random questions. So, you know, there is a very popular saying that there is a method in madness. So if somebody calls current affairs as as mad area of economics, I would beg to differ there. I would say that, no, there is a method to it. And there is a particular way in which they pick up the current affairs. And I have shown you these examples. I can show you more examples. Let me show you more examples. See this, guys. So this question says that consider the following statements in the context of intervention being undertaken under anemia mukta Bharat strategy. This question was asked because this was in the news. So what is there in the news? Initiatives to tackle anemia in women and children. Now see how you prepare for these kind of themes. This is from GS paper 2 uh, because women, poverty, social issues are in GS paper 2. So if you read this article now, which was published, if you read this article in PIB, you can see a lot of low seven, eight steps were mentioned by the PIB about what steps government has taken for anemia. Bharat. Okay. Now in prelims, they asked you just one of it. But if this question will be asked in GS paper two mains, they will say discuss the steps taken by government of India for improvement in the health status of women and children. That could be a question. So same article can be used for both prelims and mains. Hence, it is very important. And can I tell you one more important thing? I remember precisely that uh, around 2017, uh, there was this economic survey uh, where almost one full topic was dedicated related to health of women, where they talked about the fact that more than 50% women in India are anemic. And there was a nice box mentioned in the survey which said that men are no behind. So almost 50% men at that time, they were also suffering from anemia, which is a lack of uh, hemoglobin and blood in the body. So since ever since, government has been taking a lot of initiatives related to that. Now, guys, let's look at another question. This will give you an idea about how deep you have to go for preparation. See, there was a newspaper article and this article was published in Down to Earth. It said, elusive voices, India's Niger seed cultivation is declining. Here is why. So they talked about the declining cultivation of Niger seeds. Now, same year in UPSC, you had a question. 
that consider the following statements government of india provides minimum support price to naja see look at the options kind of options that this is how the questions are asked related to agriculture as you can see so question did not go too deep but yes uh, it was directly asked from the newspaper and the news articles now let's go to the next question and see what else was asked this is from ir part right see from ir what did they ask there was a news item which says european union sets up trade and technology council with india after similar partnership with usa so european union first had a partnership with us and then it is trying to have the same partnership the newspaper says it is trying to have the same partnership with india this was published now see what is the upsc question upsc question says consider the following statements recently united states of america and european council have launched the trade and technology council now if you read both the options you can clearly see that the depth of the options that have been given is very limited they are not asking us to do a, a very deep or extremely deep and disturbing analysis no it is touching upon the most important part uh, related to the trade deal at who are the partners and why they are doing it absolutely basic knowledge which a upsc aspirant is expected to know now similarly uh, you see i have uh, taken two three more questions just to show you the kind of questions asked in prelims huh? because there are two two areas from where i have felt that a lot of questions are asked and students are very uncomfortable in knowing uh, which part to attack so for example questions related to economy portion and questions related to science and tech and environment so these are the areas which i have found that a lot of students have this query that how to handle the current affairs related to these areas so see i have tried to uh, you know just uh, address those queries through these questions so see look at this question which was asked in upsc prelims recently now it says statement number one in the post pandemic recent past many central banks worldwide had carried out interest rate hike now you understand that if there is inflation interest rates are increased the moment interest rates are increased it has effect on the value of the currency it has impact upon balance of payment it also has impact upon gdp through investment so all these things are the side effects of interest rate hike second option was asking the side effects first option is the event second uh, statement which was asked is the side effect so you see here this question was asked precisely because the rate of interest in the post covid era was increased to curb inflation so this is a derived question from current affairs it is not direct current affairs but it is derived current affairs again now look at this question it says aerial metagenomics best refers to which of the following if you read all the options and similarly micro satellite dna is used for the case of which of the following studying the evolutionary relationship among various species of fauna so if you read these two terms they were directly picked from newspaper and you can clearly see that it is not going too deep but yes up to a certain extent basic idea of these terms are required just like in economics basic idea is required here also basic idea is required now look at this question this is slightly deep now it says in the context of finance the term beta refers to so you know what had happened is after the hindenburg report was released the value of the adani shares in the market it started to plunge down now stock market index like nse nifty 50 bse sensex 30 they were going up but the adani shares were going down this relationship between a particular share and the stock market index is captured through these terms like beta that is why it was in the news and it was asked in upsc so this i would say that it was slightly of a more conceptual part but again derived from current affairs so uh, i i am sure and i believe that uh, you guys are getting some idea about how newspaper events would be picked and they can also reflect indirectly in the form of some questions like this and this and this was a direct question from newspaper now let me show you uh, something very interesting which upsc has been doing off late let's read this question this is from polity this question says if if you try to read the question in a very uh, let's say confined manner you would feel that it's a very static kind of question it's not it has been highly um, inspired with current events let us see what the question says consider the following statements the election commission of india is a five member body right factual second part says union ministry of home affairs decides the election schedule for the conduct of both general elections and by elections this this uh, option is very special i'll tell you why third is election commission resolves the disputes related to splits and mergers of recognized political parties we have seen uh, recently 
uh, starting from like long time back. But um, as far as this question is concerned, from 2017 onwards, we have seen multiple cases of merger and demerger of political parties and fights within the party related to election symbol. So, for example, you can clearly see that there was infighting uh, within Shiv Sena related to the election symbol, then Samajwadi party, AIA, DMK, there was also problem related to the symbol. In this context, when there was infighting going on here, in this context, Samajwadi party and AIA, DMK, this question was asked and these two options were added because of that. So, you can clearly see, as I was telling you that around 30, 35 direct questions and if you include indirect questions like this, the number of questions from current affairs, it goes right up to 50 to 60. Precisely because of this, which means that when you read these things in the newspaper, you have to keep your eyes open to see that, OK, whenever there is a infighting related to election symbols or election dates or who conducts the election, that can also inspire a question in prelims. Now, let's talk about UPSC Bains and try to see the significance of current affairs there. Now, see, guys, <clears throat> we'll start from GS paper one. I'll tell you my analysis a little later. But first, I'll pick up the questions from UPSC and try to give you a glimpse of where uh, the current affairs fits in different GS papers. This is GS paper one. The question says, this is main's question, okay, 250 words. It says, why did human development fail to keep pace with economic development in India? Now, did you notice that since last four or five years, especially since last three years, the government of India has been uh, repeatedly mentioning it in economic survey, budget and various policies that the poverty level in India is coming down. We wanted the poverty to come down more drastically, but it has been slightly slower compared to China. But yes, we have achieved good results in terms of poverty reduction. But even then, the absolute number of poor people, which means the number of poor people below the poverty line is huge in India because our population is huge. Now, in that context, because since last two, three years, this has been in the news because of the UN report as well as Niti Aayog report, the report related to multidimensional poverty index. Because of that, this question has been asked. And imagine that if you write the answer of this question and you quote some recent reports and you quote some recent efforts by government of India, what amazing impression it can create over the examiner, which means that if you try to link these static areas also with current developments, maybe in a conclusion or maybe introduction or somewhere in the body or maybe a, a diagram you can draw, it will give an amazing power to the answer. Look at this question. It says from being the net food importer in 1960s, India has emerged as a net food exporter to the world provide reasons. Now, one of the thrust areas of government of India since last, especially five to six years is it got disturbed during COVID, but we were trying to achieve this uh, is export led growth. We have been trying to export more. One of the items which government picked to export is processed food. That is one of the reasons that this question was asked. So we are not only exporting raw food grains, we are also exporting processed food items uh, for which India has got a lot of international applause. So our food processing industry is considered to be top 10 in the world and we have the potential to become the top. So imagine that while writing this answer, if you also mention that, okay, these are the recent efforts by government of India related to food processing industry and these are the areas we are targeting, your marks will actually shoot up. So that is why there is always a scope that if you add some value in your answer uh, in GS paper one also related to current affairs, your marks will definitely go up. Let's look at this question. Let's look at this area. GS paper two now. In GS paper two, let me show you one question which was asked in the mains. E-governance as a critical tool of governance has ushered in effectiveness, transparency, accountability in the government. What inadequacies hamper the enhancement of these features? So here the question says, look at the question. Question says, E-governance is required. It's a desirable feature and it's very much required by a country like India. But then this question also says that what are the problems that India is facing despite the fact that we are promoting e-governance. So it says, see, what inadequacies hamper the enhancement. So what are the problems or limitations or bottlenecks which is not helping us to achieve, uh, to achieve this e-governance related targets? Now imagine that if you create a timeline that, okay, e-governance initiatives taken by government of India started from this year. These are the programs that the government is conducting and these are the challenges they are trying to overcome. If you add the flavor of current affairs in this answer, along with the very core idea of e-governance, of course, your marks is going to shoot up. 
Look at the next question. The crucial aspects of development process has been inadequate attention paid to human resource development. Did you notice something? This is GS paper 2, human resource development, and this is GS paper 1. Both the papers, same year, same question. Which means that here, more of governance related part, more of social aspects need to be mentioned. Same question, human development. Yes. So the dimension of the question just needs to tilt towards this paper. This is also an art. And here also the role of current affairs is very important that which scheme or which program will you write in GS paper one, which one will you write in GS paper two. This is very specialized kind of training which is required for mains exam. Now let's look at this question. This says the Gati Shakti Yojana needs meticulous coordination between the government and the private sector to achieve the goal of connectivity discuss. You understand that government of India has been constructing a lot of infrastructure, for example, through programs like NIP, NMP and Gati Shakti is a governance related program which the government has started to make sure that the infrastructure generating departments and ministries of government of India, they act in coordination with each other. Guys, you understand one point. Economics is nothing without good governance. So if you look at economics in, in uh, let's say, isolation, it doesn't make too much of sense. So when you integrate good governance with economics, then you get results. So I have a lot of cash in my hand, but I don't know how to utilize the cash. And I spend it in uh, places where I should not, wastage of resources. But if there is a system which governs me and tells you, okay, this is how you spend the money, of course, we get results. That is why this question was asked in GS paper 2. Now, let's look at this one. GS paper 2, where you can add current affairs related answer. It says, India is an age-old friend of Sri Lanka. Discuss India's role in the recent crisis in Sri Lanka in the light of preceding statement. You remember what happened to Sri Lanka because of uh, getting close to China. Sri Lanka faced some issues because of over-dependence on China, taking a lot of loans from China. And this is a well-known fact. For example, in fact, it came in the news, uh, a detailed report that even the fertilizer sent by China was not original. And then India stepped in and said that we will help Sri Lanka not only to come out of balance of payment crisis, but also uh, on a humanitarian level, we will also help them to promote their agriculture. Imagine when you are writing this kind of answer and you are quoting very old data and fact, you will not be appreciated by UPSC, which means in this kind of answers, if you start your answer with the conventional points, great, but then you have to include current affairs and the recent developments and cases to substantiate the point that yes, India and Sri Lanka were not only friends in the previous era, but they are also friends today. So it is a very famous saying, no, a friend in need is a friend indeed. So whenever it comes to rescuing and humanitarian assistance, India has been always very proactive uh, when it comes to help and Sri Lanka knows it. We also know it. We never consider Sri Lanka to be anti-India. Situations are different. Every country looks into its own progress. But the bond, whenever is required, we maintain that. In that context, this question was asked. Look at the next question. It says the expansion and strengthening of NATO and a stronger US-Europe strategic partnership works well for India. What is your opinion? Look at this question. Look at the word. What is your opinion? Which means that they are asking you a very personal question. They are saying that if NATO becomes strong and it says that a stronger US-Europe strategic partnership is good for India. Why did they ask this question? Remember, uh, Russia, Ukraine and the role of NATO there. And NATO has been trying to you know, woo India so that India could join NATO or become a stronger ally so as to go away from Russia a bit. So they have been trying to tilt us and tilt our foreign policy towards NATO. So in that context, the question is asking, in that context, newspaper articles were published and they're trying to find out that, is it good for India if NATO becomes strong? Because no, when NATO is strong, you see what happened there in Russia, Ukraine. So it's not only Russia, Ukraine, it's Russia, Ukraine, oblique NATO. Right. So in that context, this question has to be answered because it says, what is your opinion? Give reasons and examples. From where will you give examples? Little bit of past example and some of the current examples as well. Now let's come to GS paper three and see that what are the questions that you can answer actually from newspaper. See, it says question number one, what is public private partnership? Anybody can answer. And for that, you will not be given very high marks because this is a very generic question. Look at the second part. It says 
that examine the role of public private mod partnership model in redevelopment of railway stations in india that is where current affairs comes in why because since last 3 4 years the government of india is running a program called as station redevelopment program whereby more than 400 railway stations are being revamped by government of india under the model bought bought build operate and transfer so that is the reason that first part was static but second part is highly dynamic directly picked from newspaper because ev almost every second day newspaper was talking about this since last 3 years look at this question this question says besides the welfare schemes india needs debt management of inflation and unemployment to serve the poor and underprivileged section of the society this is a very special question which can be answered through a uh, newspaper only i'll tell you how two years back dr raghuram rajan and dr geeta gopinath wrote articles after articles on a topic called as philips curve philips curve tells us the relationship between unemployment as well as inflation they were trying to argue that if in a country like india inflation happens and the argument is that whenever little bit of inflation happens it's good for the economy that is the argument that we mostly have but how can we say these things because india is a very heterogeneous society where almost uh, you know 20 crore people live below the poverty line when this question was asked almost 20 21 crore people were below the poverty line now when so many people are below the poverty line how can you say that mild inflation is also okay we can manage no for you and i it's okay but for a person who is extremely poor and vulnerable a little bit rise in price is also very disturbing in that context the question is asking that whenever we suffer from inflation does india have any specific policy which we launch to safeguard the interest of the poor well in my opinion there is one which is uh, for example let's say national food security act through that we are trying to help the poor but if you ask me personally that's not good enough if i were writing this answer i would say that the steps taken by india to safeguard the interest of the poor during inflation is not sufficient because india is not only the india of rich india is also the india of low income group or poor and let me tell you personally kids that i generally don't prefer to use the word poor i find it uh, to be not very honorable i believe that rather than poor we should use the term low income group so i'll address it as low income group so for the low income group i think uh, we are not doing enough and this question precisely reflects that sentiment now let me tell you something very interesting you are going to be surprised because i have got a uh, an evidence of from where upsc asked this question look at this very popular and disturbing question which was asked so this you had to write in 250 words this was a question from uh, current mains exam uh, 17th of september i think 2023 this mains was conducted gs paper 3 there they asked distinguish between care economy and monetized economy how can care economy be brought into monetized economy through women empowerment again the theme is women empowerment we all thought that this question is i don't know from where like why did upsc ask this let me show you from where this question was asked to our very surprise this is page number 162 economic survey 2022 2023 let us see what was mentioned there in the economic survey uh, as i told you the last year's economic survey page 162 look at the title of this article it was measurement of work against employment so if i work in a factory that is called employment but if i help my family if i am a woman i help my children i help my husband i help my in-laws that's not considered to be employment but that's also work so economic survey was saying that it does not include which means the current definition of employment does not include value of see value of women's unpaid domestic work which can be seen as expenditure saving you can clearly see that this whole article that was written there in the economic survey was actually giving us the answer of this question only so it's very surprising isn't it We were, because we were thinking that it's i don't know from where this question was asked etc but that's not correct it was asked in a context and who for the very first time made a very strong argument about rewarding the women properly dr raghuram rajan when he was the governor of rbi he had raised this debate at that time so after that economic survey last year raised the same debate and said we should promote women empowerment also by accepting the fact and formalizing their work that okay if they are working in the household that also should be monetized and included in the gdp now you see in the same article it says role of self help group in women empowerment 
and in the interim budget you can clearly see that the government of india has made some allocation for this isn't it so which we are going to cover in the program so so what do we conclude a look at this question most of the unemployment in india is a structural in nature examine the methodology adopted to compute unemployment in the country and suggest measure this question was also asked from the same economic survey same chapter this was also mentioned in two pages in the economic survey you could have directly answered these two questions from page number 162 as well as two three more pages of the same topic in economic survey now <clears throat> let me tell you one question related to science and technology which was asked in gs paper 3 last year 17th of september gs paper 3 the question says what is the status of digitization in the indian economy examine the problems faced in this regard so you can clearly see it says digitization in the indian economy so this is not only about economics but digitization is also about science and technology so in the economic survey last year page number 366 you can clearly see 2022 2023 this article was written in the economic survey this paragraph was written and this paragraph says growth story of digital public infrastructure where they have mentioned sequentially what are the steps taken by government of india we just had to reproduce it in the exam by picking the right points again i have showed you last year almost six questions were directly asked from economic survey through these pages as we can see it's not very difficult to do it these things are completely doable now look at gs paper 4 what is gs paper 4 telling us normally we understand that in gs paper 4 they won't ask these questions right from current affairs but let's have a look at gs paper 4 question this is gs paper 4 around 50 words it says russia and ukraine war has been ongoing um, for last seven months different countries have taken independent stance and actions keeping in view their own national interest we are all aware that war has its own impact on the different aspects of the society so they have made reference to Russia and Ukraine and they are saying that war has different impact on different uh, you know, aspects of the society, including human tragedy. So they are saying that what are those ethical issues that are crucial uh, so that we should consider it before a war is launched. Some ethical issues that we should keep in mind in the context of Russia and Ukraine. This was asked in GS paper 4, mind you. So if you have been reading newspaper articles, uh, it's very interesting that in fact, you can use that knowledge in answering GS paper four questions also with a great uh, power and rigor. So I believe that current affairs cannot be confined to a particular GS paper. Current affairs is a sort of empowerment that you get, uh, which you can use to improve your answer and make more powerful arguments and examples across the domain of UPSC preparation. I can show you one uh, current example, which is almost very similar to this. See. So if I have to show you one, uh, one recent examples, it is this. There was one article published uh, January 26, 2024, which says the Middle East needs the UN. Will Israel listen? What does this article talk about? A beautiful article came in the newspaper. It says that Israel and Palestine, they are fighting. No issues. But it looks as if the idea of Israel is to completely vacate Gaza and complete, uh, you know, indulge in complete exodus of the people who are staying in that area. This article is not trying to politicize the issue. This article is saying that should Israel also think about those people who are going to be displaced from that geography and should that point also be included on the discussion table when UN discusses this point about conflict between Israel and Palestine. That what about those people, huh? So, because they are the citizens who stay in that area and suppose they are neutral. So, this article actually gives human angle to the displaced population. Same thing which was asked in GS paper 4 about Russia and Ukraine. So, do you see this? That when you read newspaper, uh, you also develop a line of thinking which helps you to write more maturely in the exam, isn't it? And it will also help you to articulate your argument well in essay as well as in interview. These are the articles which actually help us. Now let's look at uh, let's look at some other aspects which I have in mind. So this question I showed you related to GS paper four. So now I rest my case that current affairs can be applied in in various manner, like for example in prelims in GS paper one, two, three, four essay, as well as your optional. So this I think is very evident looking at the question. And one more myth is there that you have to go very deep into current affairs for prelims. Also, that's not correct. 
to some extent we have to we have to focus on concepts and interlinkages between static area and current affairs but for mains yes you have to go a few steps deeper into the concept that is where the differentiating factor between prelims and mains lies now one question which bothers all of us when we prepare for upsc is which newspaper to follow isn't it which newspaper to follow see <clears throat> So I have seen that uh, they will tell you, everybody will tell you that, okay, go for Hindu. A section of uh, opinion makers will tell you, go for Indian Express. And in fact, there is also a line of thought that you should integrate two newspapers. So these are the three models that I have seen, uh, like people following and students following. Uh, mostly, I believe that if you stick to one newspaper, it should do, it should solve the problem. But just one newspaper will not be good enough for UPSA. I'll tell you why. Because maybe something was covered in Indian Express and it was missed in Hindu. Maybe it was covered in Hindu. Maybe it was not covered in Hindu. So you're not very sure. Okay. Uh, second problem that happens is suppose that one newspaper is writing all the good points of this year's budget. Another newspaper will write the negative points. We have to know both because in UPSC, we cannot be biased. We are young minds. We are students. We have to be neutral. We don't have to take sides while writing answers. UPSC might ask you, what are the problems in the budget? How will you address those concerns? So my take on this is if you are reading one newspaper, great. If you are reading combination of newspaper, I would suggest let's do something else. I believe that this, uh, if you ask me normally, I think that any model is fine. There is no particular path to success. But if you ask me what is the most productive way of doing, I would say that we can select one newspaper that we are doing exhaustively. And uh, we also should take one more magazine along with the newspaper because anything that we miss here, we can cover it through the magazine. And if we have already covered the news in the newspaper and suppose magazine is giving the same thing, that's like a revision. And if you feel that you have already understood a particular article from the newspaper, well, you can skip that in the magazine and read the other areas. So I think a combination of newspaper and magazine, it, it really augurs well for UPSC. This combination, I think, suits. Why? Because anything that you miss out here, you can do here. Now, and, and the reason that I'm not telling you to read five newspapers is because being a faculty, I have seen the, the length at which you guys work hard. You make so much of sacrifices, staying away from parents many a times. There are many restrictions, issues also. You don't take care of your food and health and yet prepare for this exam. Why should we advise you things which, you know, makes you prepare for the exam for more number of years? I don't think we should give you such advice. So if we talk about ideal things, then maybe you have to read four or five newspapers. But that's not correct. We should not do that. Why for one sentence or one article, why should we refer to five newspapers? That's not a productive way and efficient way of learning. So remember, it's a competitive exam. You have to do only to the extent that you are able to answer the questions and get through the exam because country requires your services as a bureaucrat. So you should reach there as soon as possible. And how do you do that? By not wasting your time and efforts. So you can pick one newspaper, one magazine like in Vajram, we have this recital magazines. So you can create a combination that should help. Next question that a lot of students ask is how much time to devote for newspaper? Now, initially, if you are preparing for UPSC, initial days for first six months, seven months, it might take you two, two and a half hours. In some cases, I have seen three hours also. Now, that's fine. Don't be depressed about it. Don't feel bad about it. Why? Because whenever you do something new for the first time, it takes more efforts. But once you get the momentum, gradually what happens is the number of hours that you put in understanding the content goes down. There is one more thing. Initially, when you are reading the newspaper, your static areas and the concepts are not very strong because you have just started the preparation. But later on, when you understand different concepts, when you understand the, the theories and various themes through static area coverage, then you can apply it in the newspaper and your newspaper reading time goes down. So, for example, gradually it should come to one to one and a half hours. Ideally, if you ask me just before your prelims, for example, let's say in the month of January and February, if you are spending 45 minutes to one hour also, like at this time, since the new budget has come, interim budget, I think that should be good enough. But even if you are spending one to one and a half hours, that's totally okay. But anything around 45 minutes to an hour is ideal. And this happens through experience. Because I believe that if your static areas and concepts are really very strong, then if you need read newspaper, 
these two things taken together then newspaper reading will take you 45 minutes to one hour also but even if it's taking 1.5 hour is totally fine now <clears throat> this uh, theory i have already told you that ideally one year of newspaper you should cover if possible if you cover 15 to 16 months of newspaper then i think that's a very balanced way of preparing for this exam anything between 15 months 16 months 14 months should be good enough that is what i believe but even if you are covering one year of newspaper that's great but if you can cover 15 60 months that's that's sufficient now there is one uh, good thing about newspaper i'll tell you so that it takes off some pressure from you as i hope it happens sometimes isn't isn't it that suppose that you are very uh, let's say efficient in reading newspaper etc till the month of september but from october november december january you could not read the newspaper then we become depressed that oh we are not able to read the newspaper how will we proceed from there and there are people around us who will make us negative and who will make you feel that now you can't crack the exam which is totally untrue because if you have not read newspaper for one two three four months it doesn't mean that you are a bad student it doesn't simply mean that you can't crack the exam 100 percent you can how let me tell you so for example if you see newspaper has a pattern this is a rough idea uh, it's not very precise but it can be made precise for example let's say that if you read something in the month of january february march some issue is there related to agriculture you know it's a big country and the number of issues that india faces are fixed that agriculture we are facing irrigation related issue farmer suicide msp right these are the issues we are facing one or two new issues can come up anytime in the month of april may june you will see same issues being repeated yeah, in some of the months with some additional points again same issues will be repeated same issues will be repeated everything moves in a cycle so in three to so something suppose comes in the month of january related to agriculture february march it will not come again you will see the same thing around april may same thing with more points which simply means that in a span of let's say three to four months the, uh, the articles or the themes that you read in the newspaper, they are repeated. So don't give up on UPSC. Even if you have not been able to study for, let's say, three months, you could not study newspaper. Doesn't really matter. You can catch up here. Let's always be hopeful, always be positive. So that's one. Next is, <clears throat> which are the resources for newspaper? See, I have listed out some resources, popular resources. So for example, newspaper multiple. But I told you that you should avoid reading four or five newspapers. You don't have that time, right? One should not do that. So that's one. Second is monthly magazine. So various institutes like, for example, Down to Earth magazine, etc. Then there are yearly compilations. So see, for example, like Vajiram has just released its uh, prelims quick revision. This is uh, one book which we have released. So this is called as yearly compilation, right? And monthly magazine, you can see that like monthly magazine of Vajiram is recital. So this our team prepares for prelims. So you can see it's it's thinner, but the compilation that we have brought for yearly quick revision, which I'm talking about, is this. Now next one is videos. For example, let's say Rajya Sabha video debates, etc. Then frequent tests that you can take for polishing your current affairs. That is also one of the things you need to do. Then economic survey and budget yearly you will have to do it. And I have showed you so many questions in mains which are asked from economic survey. Practically entire GS paper three is from there. Then ministry portals and reports like there has been a report on poverty, production linked incentive scheme, employment, unemployment. All these reports are from Niti Aayog, which we have to do. Then you have PIB, Yojana and Kurukshetra. So these are some of the popular sources that you will have to do. Now, what we are doing in our uh, prelims program and mains program is, for example, this is how we are creating the handout. See, so you can see this is a sample handout. So, for example, this is a two page handout, which, for example, you will get in your first lecture let's say on uh, prelims program on very first day you'll get this handout which means that this has all the diagrams this has all the pictures all the tables everything is included there in two pages or three pages maybe maximum now why because if you revise it it will become easy for you to memorize with just one or two revisions and before prelims you don't need to spend too much time on this and uh, frankly speaking the coverage will be decent enough so that you don't need to add anything to it so I think if you follow this uh, handout approach, a uh, very minimalistic handout, I would say, it will take care of all these sources. Because if you read individual sources, ideally you should, but then for UPSC, you should not. The reason being that, for how long will you do all this? The reason being that you have so much of task in your hand related to prelims mains, and you have got your optional, your CSAT. So young minds like you, 
preparing so hard, putting your blood and sweat. And if I tell you, it would be so unfair if I tell you that, please take five newspapers and read it because ideally you should read five newspapers. I don't think so. So this is where I think we should draw the line. Uh, if everything is being compiled in a very minimalist handout like this, I think this should be good enough. Now, <clears throat> what are the focus areas in the newspaper? Uh, I know that uh, this question will come to your mind that when you read newspaper, what should be your focus areas? So you see, there are some articles in the newspaper which are very general articles. I'll show you. Look at this article. This article looks very fancy, isn't it? So for example, you can see uh, the Prime Minister of India, the President of France, and you see uh, the headline rates that Modi and Macron call for the humanitarian ceasefire for flow of aid to Gaza. Looks very nice, looks very catchy. But if you read the whole article, you will realize there is nothing much to it. It's a very general article. How do you call an article general and how do you know that you have to skip the article? I'll tell you. This general type of articles, there is no concept. There is no trend. There is no data. There is no content for UPSC. It's very fancy. Right. So that is why we call it very general article because it's very fancy and it does not uh, carry anything substantial. Now, <clears throat> second is opinion and views based. So there are articles which uh, some authors write, which are extremely good, very, very good articles where they express their opinions uh, and they tell you that these are the even. So, for example, if government of India launches a program called as production linked incentive scheme, authors would tell you that these are the good points. These are not so good points. Like Dr. Rajan has written an article recently and he said, make in India program has these flaws, right? So these are the articles which have strong opinions and views. We should respect the view of everybody. That is what we should do during preparation so that we have both positive and negative sides. But however, I strongly suggest because you are young mind and I think that nobody has the right to make you negative and biased. Nobody should do that because you are young mind. You should be given the freedom to think on your own. But when people write newspaper articles, sometimes they become very biased. So in that case, you have to make sure that when you study these articles related to opinion, personal extreme biases should be ignored, right? Because there is nothing black and white about life. Life is always having shades of gray. There are good sides, there are bad sides. As young minds and students, we should not be influenced too much by extremes and biases, be it any extreme. So in opinion-based article, we should definitely read it, but take both goods and good and bad sides. Factual. Uh, you must be reading a lot of articles which are very factual, which have a lot of data and trend. One question which a lot of students ask me is that when we read factual articles, data related articles, how to handle it, which data to memorize, weekly data, daily data, which data. So if you read newspaper, newspaper will tell you this week the inflation of India is 7%. Should you memorize it? Of course not. So how do you memorize the data? Which data to take? Take quarterly data, half yearly data, means three months data, six months data or yearly data. That's it. Never memorize data, always memorize the trend. For example, if you have to find out what has been the inflation in India. So find out the inflation in India over a period of, let's say, last six months and create a chart like this, something like this, that inflation is like, okay, this is called as a recent trend. Similarly, if you create a chart which says inflation in India between the year 2015 and 2024, right? So this is like almost, let's say, nine year, 10 year data. So this is called as long term trend. So what is short term trend? Short term trend would mean recent two, three years, one year, six months. Long term trend means five years, six years, 10 years. So two types of data or trends should be memorized, recent and long term. So that if UPSC says what has happened in India in last 10 years, we can answer. So daily data, weekly data, not required. Now, there are other news items also like political, corporate, sports and awards. I would say focus on sports and awards. These two are not very important. If something from corporate is important, we can include that in economics part. Hardcore corporate things like this company has merged with that company. Not very relevant for UPSC. Important for MBA exam, not very relevant for UPSC. But sports and awards, we should definitely focus. Economic survey and budget, I have already uh, shown you with proofs how important it is. It's a myth that survey and budget were important earlier and it is not. I have shown you with page numbers that practically... 90% uh, of GS paper 3 economics and agriculture part was from economic survey and budget. Extremely important. Science and tech and environment. Very, very important. 
when you are preparing for UPSC, these two areas give a lot of headache to the students because they are unpredictable. Why are they unpredictable? Because they are asked from newspaper. So one way to do science and tech and environment is to focus on one newspaper whole year along with one solid magazine, whatever you feel like. So for example, let's say that you are doing a newspaper and a magazine. So if you miss something here, it can be done here. If you have already done it here, it's a good revision for you here. So a combination of newspaper and magazine along with some MCQ test that only can help you with understanding of science and tech and environmental related questions. Did you notice yesterday, uh, did you notice that, uh, you know, if you're reading the newspaper since last few days, you will see if IR and economics news are being given, equal amount of importance is also being given to science and tech and environment. Pick up yesterday's news, any newspaper. These two are very important. We should never ignore them. And in today's uh, webinar, did you notice that I have taken a lot of questions from science and tech precisely to show you that you should not ignore this and also to tell you, give you a very positive side to it that if you are very thorough and uh, very regular with uh, newspaper and current developments, either through magazine or newspaper, you can easily answer these two questions because very tough questions are not asked in these two areas. Conceptual questions are asked, which you can handle if you are trained in the right way. This I have already shown you the example of general article. Now, what is the example of opinion based article? I have shown you this that recently this article was published. I will give you one more example of opinion based article and how you should create a balance. When demonetization happened, let me give you a very uh, balanced view on that. When demonetization happened, Nobel laureate Dr. Amartya Sen said demonetization is very bad. He wrote all the articles on that. Uh, Dr. Uh, you see. Now, Dr. Muhammad Yunus, who already won the Nobel Prize in Economics, he supported demonetization. Dr. Geeta Gopinath, who is the chief economist IMF, she says in few things, demonetization did wonders for India. In few aspects, it was bad. So what did you observe? If you only read his articles, you will feel demonetization is very bad. If you read his articles, you will feel demonetization is very good. But if you read both the articles, then you will clearly see, OK, these are the good sides. These are not the good sides. As a student of UPSC, one should learn to look at both the sides of a policy. We have to be neutral. We have to be objective if you want to crack this exam. So how to create that? You should cover both the sides. And for that, coverage is, uh, coverage is very important in UPSC. But as I told you that you cannot read five, six newspapers because one newspaper talked about one side, one newspaper talked about another side. Here comes the role of these magazines along with one newspaper, one magazine because it will help you to get both the sides of the spectrum because whosoever creates a magazine uh, let me let me be very candid on this that whosoever works on the magazine anywhere across india they do a great work they do a lot of hard work in creating these magazines and uh, they try to put both the sides of the spectrum in the same magazine so i think any magazine if you are reading you are doing a good job now, how to handle data about UPSC? That, that's a big question. Now, <clears throat> data becomes a big headache if you don't know how to handle it. And, you know, uh, a very famous economist had said that every data speaks, every number speaks. You should just be able to understand their language. So how to handle data? I would suggest you to do something. So, for example, let's say that you take a piece of paper like this. You take A4 sheet like this, okay? Take some A4 sheets like one, two, three, four example, or take a diary, take a notebook. The first five pages of your notebook, you can write here agriculture. Whenever you read any data or report in newspaper related to agriculture, like contribution of agriculture in GDP, for example, is let's say 15%. Number of people engaged in agriculture is let's say 50-60% uh, of India. So you can write those data that contribution of agriculture in GDP, 15%. Number of people employed this. Then any new scheme by government of India, PM, for example, let's say uh, Kisan Sampada Yojana. So you can mention here PM Kisan. So something like this and the some data, basic data. I told you monthly, quarterly, half yearly, these data you can mention. So very, very precisely you can create this data book of your own. So let's say that you have taken a nice, let's say you have taken a, a, a notebook like this. So first five pages, you can write agriculture. Next few pages, environment related data. Next few pages, GDP. Next few pages, women empowerment. I say, okay, you can take a diary and you can devote some pages for each of these themes. This will be a very personalized diary of yours. And to motivate yourself and pep yourself up, you can write your name here, XYZ, 
and you should always write what you want to achieve what rank are you seeing so for example if you are looking at rank one write rank one if you are looking at a rank under 50 write rank under 50 so that it should motivate you and this should be a very personal data book that you should carry it will help you not only in prelims but prelims mains interview all the places one question that you can ask me is that will the data get old not really india is a big country if the gdp of india today is let's say 6.4 percent automatically it will not become 20 percent from 6.4 it will become 6.57 something like this in a few months big changes don't happen so because we are a big country so that is why this data book will be very handy for you it will be very helpful for you this you can create actually recent developments let me tell you how to handle newspaper and what we are going to do in the Vajiram program for you uh, let's let's read this uh, news that came it says ahead of Ayodhya event PM Modi visits Tamil Nadu temple linked to Ram now this article came in the newspaper when you read this article you will feel yeah it's political let's leave it no let's look beyond politics here for some time let's see what are the aspects related to UPSC hidden in it which UPSC can ask you can clearly see that uh, Prime Minister of India went to a few temples before going to uh, Ayodhya for the inauguration of the Ram Temple. Where did he go? So see, the newspaper says that he went to a temple in Rameshwaram, then he went to a temple in Dhanuskodi, and then he went to a temple in Srirangam, right? Trichy. So these three temples' names are there. And uh, this article also talks about uh, recitation of um, stories related to Ram in different languages. So all these, some texts have been mentioned, some old philosophies have been mentioned here in this article. So I won't be very surprised if UPSC will ask you a question related to temple architecture or some philosophy or uh, some religious text, which is connected to these temples. This is how you have to pick the news uh, items from newspaper and go little deep into it, not very deep, but maybe two steps backwards, two steps forwards, and you will be able to see how to use these things. This is what we are trying to do in our program. So, for example, whenever we are creating a handout for you, handout like let's say two pages handout for prelims, what will we do? We'll pick this uh, temple's name and we will tell you that, okay, which architecture is being followed, how this temple uh, you know, came into being, under which era it was constructed, what is so special about it, what is the connection with this temple and religion or some philosophical school of thought. So basic ideas will be put in a box which you can easily use it prelims so this is what we are trying to do now for example recently uh, i can tell you the date january 28 2024 very recent few days back only three days back you can see that there is a news which came it says isro's space platform poem 3 achieves all payload objectives set to re-enter earth this is a science and technology related news now upsc can very well ask you a question like they asked the chinese question they can ask you this question that what is poem right so, for example, it's the PSLV orbital experimental module or POEM. This is POEM actually. So, you can give you like four options and they say which of the following is true about POEM. These are the basic things that UPSC will ask you in science and technology. They don't ask very difficult questions, but yes, they do ask you some conceptual questions for which you need to have some basic understanding. Now, <clears throat> this is today's budget. These are the four pillars on which the budget stands. So this forms the underlying idea of today's budget, as I was telling you. We will cover it uh, during our program. Now, similarly, you can see, I wanted to talk about this one for two minutes today. See, in this budget, the government of India says that the whole idea of the budget is prosperous Bharat in harmony with nature, modern infrastructure and opportunities. This is mentioned here. So what is the meaning of this, guys? See, it says prosperous Bharat in harmony with nature. Nature means environment. Now, modern infrastructure, because government of India is pushing a lot on infrastructure construction for development, opportunities for all means equity in distribution. Now, these are the ideas mentioned in the budget. It says, Vixit Bharat by 2047. You remember, the previous target of government of India was, by the year 2025, we wanted $5 trillion GDP. Now, the idea has become, by 2047, we have to become a developed country. What is the difference between these two? This talks about only growth. That is why UPSC was asking question related to growth and development. But whenever you say developed country, you know who gives the definition of developed country? World Bank. And how do they define developed country looking at per capita income? So 
what is the meaning of developed country that not only your gdp but distribution of income is also important so they basically talk about per capita income which means if the population of a country is high you need to have higher gdp so that you can distribute it well which means the government is moving slightly away from only gdp towards more of inclusive growth this question can be asked in upsc now that what is the difference between growth and equity equitable distribution what is the idea of social justice they can ask you in gs paper 4 john rawls theorem these are the things they can ask you in upsc now because the idea of growth is different from the idea of inclusive growth so till last year we were focusing on growth now this says that we want inclusive growth that is why developed country and in prelims they can ask you what are the measures of inequity inequality right for example let's say lorentz curve is there gini coefficient is there right these are the questions that, that can be asked in upsc so what are we going to do for you in our course in our current affairs lectures that will provide you there will be videos there will be handout for prelims and as i told you that handout for prelims will talk about uh, you know that kind of handout which can be easily used for revision the coverage will be really good in these handouts very crisp to the point few pages only but the mains handouts will also be designed in such a way that we are able to establish interlinkages uh, between various subjects coverage will be really good and this handout will be designed in such a way that you are able to revise well and you are able to write answers also wajiram has introduced this coupon code for you that if you want to actually uh, avail this uh, use this coupon code and you will get some discounts over the courses now <coughs> having uh, said all those things related to current affairs preparation and the course i now invite all of you uh, to ask any queries or doubts or questions that you want to ask related to current affairs preparation or uh, related to the course all right thank you and study well guys and you have anything to ask you get in touch with us god bless you do well in the exam see you in the classroom